G.K. Nielsen said, I quote, successful people are not gifted. They just work hard, then succeed on purpose. I unquote. What a fantastic quote to begin this session. And so I agree by complimenting yours with the words of Walt Disney. He said, all our dreams can come true if we have the courage to pursue them. Good evening, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Welcome to Avenue 2021, a global virtual career guidance program launched by Indian School Alwadi Al-Kabir under the aegis of the Board of Directors of Indian Schools in Oman. On behalf of Indian School Alwadi Al-Kabir, I, Ishan of Class 8, and I, Taranjot of Class 9, from ISWK, take the proud privilege of expressing our profound gratitude to His Majesty Haikam bin Tariq al said for the altruistic and noble benevolence showered on the Indian diaspora in the Sultanate of Oman. We, the Indian expatriates, are fortunate indeed to enjoy a world-class quality of life in a country that is modern, peaceful, and full of natural beauty. May the Almighty shower his choicest blessings on his majesty, and may this nation experience peace and everlasting prosperity. It gives me immense pleasure to welcome the Chairman, Board of Directors, Indian Schools in Oman, Dr. Shivakumar Shiv Manikam. Manikam. We wholeheartedly welcome dignitaries from the Ministry of Education, distinguished officials from CBSE, and officials from the Indian Embassy. A cordial and courteous welcome to all the members of the Board of Directors of Indian Schools in Oman. A hearty welcome to Mr. Alkesh Joshi, the president of ISWK Management Committee and other members of the School Management Committee of Indian School Alwadi Al Kabir. A heartfelt welcome to principals, vice principals, assistant vice principals, HODs, coordinators, supervisors, and the entire teaching fraternity across all the globe. I am extremely delighted to welcome students from all over the world, parents, grandparents, invitees, and all our well-wishers. We cordially welcome distinguished members of the business community and members of the educational cell. I feel elated for the August audience for sparing your time out of your busy schedule to invest in your dreams. Thank you one and all once again for your gracious presence here this evening. Dream big and dare to fail, said Norman Vaughan. It is with great delight and immense pride that I take the honor of introducing our guest speaker, Mr. Parag Patankar. He is an entrepreneur, educator, and cyclist. Mr. Parag Patankar is a technology and social entrepreneur who builds fine tech products and also mentors students to create better education and work opportunities, having helped over 5,000 students in the last five years an IIM Ahmedabad alumnus and electronics engineer. He was India lead and director, collaboration at Cisco and senior director at, at Oracle. He helps build product-based technology companies in India as IIM8 technology SIG coordinator and teaches product management at IIM Ahmedabad and IIM Bangalore. He is passionate about giving back through education for underprivileged youth. He helped set up the Edupark School in rural India and led technology strategy for a Gates Foundation effort to provide better education to kids in Indian slums and inner city US schools. Post COVID, he has published articles and trained 2000 plus teachers to teach better online. He is an avid cyclist, braving the Bangalore traffic to commute to work and organizes and participates in Brevet rides on weekends, having been a super randoner twice. Aligned to the objective of catering to the diverse needs of our student community, the theme for Avenir 2021 is design, 
weaving in the nine multiple intelligences among humans, which can be compared to the nine gems that adorn a priceless necklace. The cat's eye color golden brown reflects intrapersonal intelligence, which is related to self-awareness and the ability to recognize one's strengths and weaknesses. Students having a high quotient of this intelligence can excel as researchers, philosophers, counselors, therapists. And the gemstone allied to Mr. Parag Patankar's personality is the cat's eye. I would like to request the audience to kindly post your queries in the chat box. Without further ado, let's welcome our most honored guest, Mr. Parag Patankar. The platform is all yours, sir. Thank you, Ishan, and uh, thank you, Taranjot. Uh, wonderful to be here today. And I'm absolutely delighted and excited to be back with the uh, Indian school community. So I have fond memories of uh, visiting the school. About three years ago, I had done a workshop in the school. Uh, last year, I had the opportunity to work with some of the teachers uh, in the Indian school to help them uh, teach more effectively using online teaching techniques and tools. And uh, this effort of Avenir 2021 is absolutely fabulous, uh, extremely useful for students in figuring out uh, where they should focus their energies and where to head next. Uh, yesterday, uh, there was a fabulous talk by Mr. Sam Petroda. Mr. Petroda was one of my engineering times uh, heroes. And uh, one of the things that he did, which was unique and probably not been done again, is set up this corporation called CDOT which actually brought India to the forefront of telecom technology. Uh, unfortunately, we have not kept that edge, but absolutely fabulous story and a fabulous person. It's hard to believe he's 80 and he's so energetic. Uh, listening to all these talks, uh, I got a feeling that there's so much I can do. I can be anything I want. I am pretty sure that's something that uh, it resonates with a lot of the students as well. Uh, question is, given the infinite number of things I can do and finite time, I can be anything I want, but can I be everything I want? Maybe, maybe not. So today let's explore that theme a little bit in this talk and I'll try and keep it interactive as much as possible. So I will uh, post some questions and uh, using the chat function of Zoom, I would like people to uh, send their responses. So I remember as a high schooler, I was extremely unhappy being dragged to family events. Uh, the primary reason being there used to be a lot of well-meaning family members who would come over, especially uh, my grandparents, and their friends and tell me, oh, your father was so bright and so athletic and what is your plan for life? Where are you headed? What are you up to? Or others coming up and telling me, our neighbor's son got into AIMS or IIT or MIT. And uh, if you want, I'll introduce you to him and you can pick his brain on what you could do in life. And I used to cringe. I mean, here I was in grade 11, struggling with trigonometry. In fact, I failed a trigonometry test once. And uh, everyone else was sort of putting me on the track to massive glory, which I felt I was not prepared for. And things have only gotten worse since then. So if you look at uh, admissions for Delhi University this year, Nine programs in eight colleges had a cutoff of 100%. And if you think that's because of COVID this year, 
even the previous years have seen those cutoffs going to near 100%, so 99, 99.5. In Korea, they have this end of high school test, which everyone takes. And there are three universities that everyone wants to get into. So the Seoul University, Korea University, and Yonsei University. So either it's sky or you fall from grace. In China, there's an end of school test called Gaokao. And every high schooler has to write this. And your rank on the Gaokao decides where you end up for university. So it's just a one shot at success. And uh, the people who do well on the test that day get into prestigious universities like Peking University or Shanghai University, and the rest have to then settle for other universities and programs. Some of them don't even get admitted. So China has about 10 million students who graduate every year and uh, high school students. And there are only six and a half million seats in universities in China. So roughly one third of the high school class will not even get a shot at going to college. Uh, things are no different in the US. So there's tremendous amount of pressure on SAT scores, ACTs, AP exams. And then in the US, you have this additional thing of resume building. So they just don't want a high score on the test. They also want you to be a very rounded person with excellent extracurricular achievements and sporting achievements as well. So given all this pressure, students have to grapple with this question of, I need to decide fairly quickly and get on with preparing for whatever track I am going towards. And making decisions under pressure is always hard. And especially at this age, it's even harder because there are so many other decisions to make about how to manage peers, relationships, expectations from friends and family. And so what happens? One potential thing that I have seen is uh, students start believing things that they might not be well served by believing. So quick interactive question now. So this quote is fairly famous. Uh, who's this person in the picture? So using the chat window, just post your responses. So who is this person? So I'm just going to watch and see if any of you get this and, and it's okay to Google. So go ahead and Any responses on the chat? Uh, any guesses? Who's this person? Okay, all right. Mark Twain, Aaron Vergis. Good, all right. Anyone else? Okay, I'm going to make this harder. So what's his real name? And why is this quote famous? Come on, people. The real name is fairly Googleable. All right. Samuel Langhorn Clemens Tanjot. Yes. Wonderful. All right. And where all have we seen this quote? Okay. All right. Adish. Okay. So some people are getting this right. Okay. So this quote featured in the movie, The Big Shot. Uh, it also featured in the documentary. Uh, the inconvenient truth about climate change and we are seeing climate change becoming a major problem in the last few years. Uh, this quote has been used by multiple American presidents. And you know what? Mark Twain never said this. So the quote itself tells us how powerful this fallacy is of 
knowing for sure something is true and it isn't so why are we talking about this in the context of today's session so this is something that i see repeatedly happening with decisions that students have to make under pressure so one potential thing that i see happening repeatedly is uh, students do well in a particular set of subjects in school so middle school or high school and automatically they assume that this puts them on a good path for a specific kind of career or uh, even educational option so let's say for example somebody who's good at maths and physics uh, is naturally told okay engineering is the best choice for you but how do i know that i will love engineering and engineering will equally love me back same thing applies to other things so let's say i love baking as a hobby how do i know that baking as a hobby once a month on a weekend is as exciting as waking up every day at 5 am and baking professionally things look very different when you have to do something again and again so just think about some of the assumptions you've made when you make some of these decisions my school is a high uh, my son is a high schooler and uh, i was speaking to one of his friends recently and uh, so his friend said uh, i want to study computer science at a top university and uh, so i asked him okay do you enjoy programming uh, what do you like about computer science in your uh, high school courses and uh, with a very straight face uh, he told me actually you know what i took physical education as the fifth subject in high school and not programming not computer science because then i can focus on my engineering entrances now this to me is a fairly good way of shooting yourself in the foot so i have spent 22 years in the software industry and i can tell you that i see this repeatedly there are lot of bright people in the software industry who would have been way happier doing something else but they just chose computer science because of the glamour and uh, now they are of course doing well professionally uh, earning good salaries but uh, always thinking about what if i had listened to my heart and done something else so fine let's say we don't fall into this trap what else can we do to figure out where am i headed next so one thing that people are told is uh, yeah there are career tests there's a magic wand you spend anything between 30 minutes to 2 hours answering a series of questions and uh, that will tell you definitely what your strengths are and where you are headed but take this with a pinch of salt as well uh, the history of these career tests is very interesting they were actually invented by a person called john holland and the reason he did this was he was as a psychologist asked to classify during world war 2 what kind of fresh recruits into the us army would be fit for what kind of roles so who would be fit for a role that requires them to mostly sit at a desk and plan things who would be uh, good at leading people in the face of uncertainty who would be good at taking care of wounded soldiers and so on he extended this construct and uh, now a lot of people uh, take this as a gospel which is not right so uh, remember that these are shortcuts so they may give you some hints but uh, it's not going to in 15 minutes or 2 hours tell you everything you know need to know about yourself a uh, case in point my son's school had a career uh, counseling program and uh, my son took the test as well and uh, the test result they told him okay architecture is something that you are best suited for and uh, my son just can't draw to save his life he can't visualize so i don't know 
where that heuristic went wrong, maybe he misled the test, maybe not. But thing is, you can't trust a shortcut and a few hours to lead you to your destiny. So we've now said, look, don't go by gut instinct. Don't, don't go by your high school or middle school marks in certain subjects to make your decisions. Don't go by career tests. What else can we do? Well, the one thing that's being talked about over and over these days is find your passion and then everything else will work out. Is that uh, really true? Let's explore this. So quick quiz again. So use the chat window. Who's this person on the right? And why is he famous? So this person was extremely passionate about something. Who is he? All right. Gregor Mendel, yes. And uh, what is he famous for? All right. Father of genetics. Wonderful. Okay. So I don't know if people in the audience are taking turns and answering one at a time. So I would like more participation. So currently I'm seeing only a couple of people answering. So there's a very interesting story about Gregor Mendel. So guess what was Gregor Mendel's passion? Put it into the chat window. What was he truly passionate about? And I'll give you a clue, it, it wasn't peace. So peace made him famous, but he was actually passionate about something else. Statistics, okay, good guess. Inheritance, good guess. No, that's not the answer I'm looking for. Traits, okay, all, all these are things related to what he did with his studies on crossbreeding, uh, tall and short pea plants and figuring out the traits, inheritance patterns, induce a fair amount of statistics. Uh, but what Gregor Mendel was really passionate about was teaching school students. So he wanted to be a school teacher more than anything else. He wrote the school teacher's test. So in Austria at that time, you had to clear the test to become a school teacher. So he wrote it the first time uh, he did not pass. Uh, he prepared again, wrote the test a couple of years later, uh, again failed by a small margin. He took the test a third time and unfortunately again failed in the practical exam. And his hopes of becoming a school teacher was dashed. He went back to the monastery where he was a monk and uh, he took up gardening duties. And he was a curious soul. He loved gardening. He was bright. He turned his attention to patterns he saw in the rearing of peas. And now we know him as the father of genetics and uh, absolutely famous person for that. The irony is that uh, he published this paper about peas in 1866. And nobody read that paper. It was lying in the shelves of some libraries. It was only in 1900 that a Dutch botanist, Hugo de Vries, actually read that paper and said, wow, this guy has uncovered the secret of inheritance and genetics. So again, I mean, the twist is, yeah, I'm passionate about something. I can get to that. I do something else that is within my reach. Is that great? Yes. But then does that mean that this will lead me to glory and money? Maybe, maybe not. So fine, find your passion, but then your passion may uh, A, not be realized and B, even if it is realized, it may take a long time for people to understand what you're saying. So if I haven't depressed you enough, let me depress you some more. Uh, let's say I figure out all these things and then I decide 
what kind of colleges or courses I want to join and I get admitted. So when I'm admitted, I'm on cloud nine. And so was I. So when I got into I am Ahmedabad, I thought, whoa, life is made. Now there's nothing more. I have to coast my way towards glory and become a CEO in a short period of time. Uh, unfortunately, reality crept in. So after a few weeks, we had our tests and then 45 days into the course, we had our first midterm and uh, I finished the midterm. I was sort of okay with how I had done. They gave us the scores back and one of my friends in my hostel was looking extremely upset. And I said, what happened? He said, oh, I got a C in maths. I said, that's fine. Half the class got uh, C's or D's. I said, no, 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 you don't understand. I'm the gold medalist from, I won't name the university and the college he went to, but it's extremely prestigious. And I have always been first in my class. How can this happen to me? Now, the sad reality is that at IMA or Harvard or Stanford or Princeton or MIT or Oxford, everyone else who got in were at the top of their class. So the bar is reset now. So I have to, again, haul myself up and start working hard. And in consequence, the survey said 57% of US college students feel a great deal of pressure at any given point of time. Let's say I somehow get through college and get my dream job. Does that mean life is hunky-dory after that? Uh, not really. Most people say that they don't really enjoy their work. 80% of Spanish workers say they dislike or hate Mondays. 50% of Americans hate their jobs. Is there a better way? Maybe there is. So let's just switch tracks and think about 18 months ago when COVID first struck. What happened then? Uh, initially, we didn't know much about COVID. And there was a lot of anxiety, stress, tension. We were all trying to figure out at home how to keep ourselves safe. Uh, as time went by, we understood a little more and we were there sitting at home, not allowed to go out and play with friends, uh, cannot go to school or college. Uh, most sports facilities were closed. You're stuck at home. So what happens? After a while, I start feeling bored. And this is a normal human condition. So when a new situation presents itself, we feel anxious. After a while, that situation becomes routine or mundane, we start getting bored. Now, is this something that's felt only by normal high school students or people like me? No. Even gods of cricket like MS Dhoni feel this. So in a recent interview, Dhoni said, I feel pressure when I walk out to bat. I feel scared too. Does Dhoni ever feel bored? Yes. So Dhoni has now set up cricket coaching academies in a few cities. And if he's uh, doing some routine administrative work, related to his academy, he does feel bored. But when do you see Dhoni really coming alive? So in the IPL final few weeks ago, we saw that he swung matches in favor of his team and they won the championship. So it's when he's set at the crease, you can look at his face. He's giving it all. He's concentrating extremely hard. He's in the zone. He's in the flow. So what is the state of flow? The state of flow is when I'm focusing only on one thing that I am seeing. So if I'm playing cricket, I'm just focusing on this ball that's arriving and how do I tackle it best to score runs for my team or how do I do my wicket keeping duties 
extremely well. I'm not thinking about anything. I'm not distracted. I'm not hungry. I'm not thirsty. Time stops for me. So this is a state of flow. And how do we get into a state of flow? It's fairly simple. So between anxiety and boredom is the state of flow. When my skills are stronger than the challenge that I'm faced with, I'm bored. So in Dhoni's context, when Dhoni is doing routine paperwork for his cricket academy, he is bored because this is stuff that he's learned. It's easy for him. So his skills are way higher than the challenge that's facing him. When he goes out to bat initially, let's say on a hostile pitch with a great bowler coming into bowl, he feels anxious, stressed. But in between, he feels flow. So if I am bored to get into flow, simple way is I increase the challenge level. If I am feeling anxious to get back into flow, I increase my skills. So let's say Dhoni is doing routine paperwork and board. Maybe he creates a mental game to get over that boredom and says, okay, while I am doing this, I'm also going to figure out how profitable this academy is, how well the students are doing, maybe use some of the statistical tools and keep himself challenged. With anxiety, let's say there's a new fast bowler that people are not able to cope with. He can uh, step back, go to the nets, increase his skills on, say, facing uh, bouncers that come right up into the chin. Get back into flow. So you can see this in sports. You can see this in academics. People who are in a state of flow are extremely enthralled. Now, why are we talking about flow because flow is what makes life meaningful, work purposeful and enjoyable. So how do I understand what are the things that will get me into flow or not get me into flow? Well, there's only one way. You need to just do it. And when I say do, as the wise Yoda said, there's do or do not. There's no try. Try means, yeah, I'm going to give it a half-hearted attempt or I'm going to just think about doing it and not even take the first step. So if I don't do anything, I'm at zero. Fine. Nothing ventured, nothing lost, nothing gained either. If I do something, if it works, I gain. If it fails, I lose something. If I'm smart about figuring out every attempt that I do something, if the gain is slightly more than the loss, I come out ahead. So anytime I do something, I'm learning something new. I am becoming stronger in terms of the skills I have. Maybe I'm networking, I'm getting to know more people in the field I want to work in. So you have to just do it. Now, we talked about the fact that there's so many different things I can try, so many inspiring speakers talking here at Avenir. Can I try everything? No, there's finite amount of time, right? So how do I decide what to try and what not to try? Amazon founder Jeff Bezos has this simple framework. He calls it the regret minimization framework. So he says, think forward maybe 10 years, 20 years ahead in your life. Would you regret not doing this? If you would regret this simple answer is yes absolutely go and do it if you think you're not going to regret it fine don't bother there are enough other things to try and do which are exciting but do things now this sounds very energizing and simple so it's simple but not easy and why do i say that well i can just do it but then after just doing it how do i know that i want to spend a lot of time doing this it takes by some measures 10000 hours to master a craft and uh, there's something that malcolm gladwell wrote a book about 
uh, and he quoted a study by a person called Anders Ericsson. Now, to go back to our so-called Mark Twain tweet, uh, uh, quote, which wasn't really true. It's true in this case as well. So it's not truly 10,000 hours, but there's a significant amount of time that one needs to spend to master something. So given that I want to try a lot of things, is there a smart way of trading this off? Yes, there is. And I know students are extremely busy. There's so much of homework. There are extracurricular activities. There's some time to go out, play with friends, uh, game, etc. So here's a simple shortcut that I have tried and has worked for me. It's a rule of 10, 10, 10, 10. So start with 10 hours. Something that seems interesting to me, give it 10 hours. Now 10 hours is something that anyone, however busy they are, can squeeze in into a week or two weeks time. Do a basic exploration, try your hand at some of these things. So let's say, I think I might be good at baking. So I should spend some time researching recipes, look for ingredients, and then try baking myself at least once. So that will give me a sense of how kick I am after spending 10 hours. Now let's say, in those 10 hours, I decided, no, this is not for me. I check it, no regrets. So 10 hours invested, but yes, I have learned one thing that I don't like doing. Let's say I like doing it. Ramp it up by a factor of 10 again. So invest 100 hours in this. So where do I find 100 hours? So in a three to six month time frame, so one term or one semester or one half year, time frame in a student's life, you can do this. So how do I try something seriously? Best way is find somebody who's skilled at this and go work with them. So do an unpaid internship, do a project with them. Some of these things you can do without traveling. Let's say I'm interested in writing. Just create a blog, start writing, find some people who are good writers, get feedback from them and iterate. So put 100 solid hours into it. By then, I will know whether I really want to do this or not. And this then gives me clues into, is it for me or is it not for me? And not having to rely on past marks or simplistic career tests or uh, fashionable passion advice. Now I've kicked the tires, I've tried it myself. Maybe it works for me, maybe it doesn't, but it's something that I know for myself. It's not hearsay. So why are we talking about this in the context of skills, success, and the choices that high schoolers need to make? Because these are the skills that are the baseline of whatever makes me succeed. So simple steps. I start with understanding myself. Who am I? What are the things that I have tried and figured out I enjoy doing and I don't enjoy doing? And you can look at broader patterns. So it's not just the baking aspect. So when you intern with somebody and you're required to be at the bakery at 5 or 6 a.m. to uh, bake fresh bread for the morning's customers, I will also find out that it's not just baking. I hate waking up at 5 a.m. Or it could be the other way around. So I don't like the baking part, but I love waking up at 5 a.m. So what else have I learned? So now I know I don't like one thing. I like something else. And whenever I am doing something, I can use the flow framework. So always keep myself between anxiety and boredom and keep improving my skills. So every time I take up something new, invest 10 hours, either decide to take this more seriously and do it for 100 hours or drop it off and have good reasons for doing that. And then given that there's a finite amount of time, just do it. So minimize regrets. Uh, 
time box it and this leads us to what have we discussed today this is the way to make smart decisions and what's the thing that a student is going to be called upon to decide in the near future is uh, what are the education choices that i am going to make in the near future so with that uh, i will open up the chat to questions uh, if you want to do this yourself first hand as i said listening and hear say is not going to cut it we saw this with the passion we saw this with the so called mark twin quote so you need to do this yourself and if you want to join me and do this yourself i will host a small interactive workshop so i'm going to put out a link in the chat window so you can uh, use that link fill up a simple google form and uh, join me for a fun interactive workshop so i'm going to stop sharing my screen let me just post the link out to everyone and uh, please post questions you have i'd be happy to answer them thank you sir that was a truly informative and inspiring <laughs> session dear audience you are requested to fill in the feedback form which has been posted in the chat box to uh, and fill in this form is necessary as it would fetch your participation certificate for those who have joined through youtube you are requested to check the description box for the link of the feedback form now i'd request our most honored speaker mr parag patanka to kindly answer a few questions put forth by our audience for that i'd like to invite our moderator for today's session ma'am monica to pose some questions to you over to you ma'am good evening sir good evening ma'am it was really a very enriching and enlightening session from your end sir but there are some questions uh, so with your permission can i ask yes yes please go ahead yes so what are your approaches for student skill development what kinds of skills do the students have and relating to the current scenario of pandemic so there is a, there would be a change of skills that they need to develop so how would you go about it sir okay wonderful question so uh the skills for high schoolers i think are fairly the same i won't say the pandemic has changed it a lot but there are a couple of things and i'll talk about those so high school is a time of tremendous changes for the student so physically mentally emotionally socially so puberty is happening the body is changing radically uh transition in social norms is happening so at that point students are becoming or on their path to becoming independent women and men from girls and boys so there is a duality where parents and teachers and society around the students start expecting more of the student yet when the uh, sort of rubber hits the road they also sometimes say no you are still a child so there is that friction then there is tremendous amount of peer pressure and anxiety about getting ahead in life so what are the things that i need to learn what are the colleges i need to apply to and so on so at the core of all of this is i would say critical thinking am i able to gather relevant information am i able to first analyze it look for patterns and then synthesize it to make choices that are meaningful and relevant for me so a choice that is meaningful and relevant for me may be very different for somebody else so that comes from having a framework where i have collected both the data that is relevant and i have decided what are the criteria i am going to use to make that decision so critical thinking and then of course self discipline managing my time uh, managing expectations that's something that i've seen 
high schoolers do get challenged by and to be fair i mean there's just so much happening in their lives that they are going to disappoint some people some of the time which is okay as long as they are transparent about it and upfront about it uh now coming to your question in terms of because of the pandemic how things are changing i think the managing yourself in terms of managing time and being self disciplined has become more critical so earlier when a student was sitting in the classroom there was no opportunity to do other things or at least i mean not a huge amount of opportunity to do other things and this is something that uh, i've trained over 2000 teachers in the last year and a half and this is one thing that uh, repeatedly comes up that uh, in class i can see that student i can read the body language at the most some bright students will have a novel under the desk and they'll be reading it but beyond that they can't do anything but in a virtual class the student has another browser tab where so i've seen this pattern repeatedly boys are playing uh, video games girls are busy uh, chatting on whatsapp so i'm i'm not trying to be gender biased here but there's a pattern that i have seen quite often so so distractions are easy to give into so i think self discipline and managing your time and other people's expectations becomes a lot more important than earlier the other thing is the pandemic has changed the way education itself is now shaping up i mean and this is something that has been happening so about 15 years ago mit decided to open source all their courses using mit open courseware so today somebody who is really bright and driven can actually learn from the best professors at mit so they won't get the certificate but they will get everything else so mit gives you the tests they give you all the coursework they give you all the video recordings of the lectures in fact some of the profs at mit are even generous enough to respond to students questions so there's a physics professor called walter lewin uh who actually responds to high schoolers questions on physics uh, people who are preparing for say sats or je and so on thank you so much uh relating to your answer there's another question that sure. pops up in my mind and that is how can we bring uh, it to scale so all students can succeed in a, a global knowledge economy which is very important i feel right absolutely brilliant question and uh, again see uh, lots of choices means lots of confusion so earlier there was a restraint there were a particular set of colleges i could apply to because of uh, geographical restraints financial restraints and so on now that's no longer true so using online platforms like edx i can pretty much enroll for any kind of course so maybe there are some exceptions i still can't study medicine online or surgery but uh, by and large outside of that most courses are there on edx so step 1 was just the content the content is already there step 2 was certification so now i can even get certified by writing pro- proctored exams conducted by these online platforms so i have a certificate now that is maybe not as uh, valuable as a formal college degree but still reasonably uh, good at signaling my uh, skills at that particular thing now the challenge is that given that all this is accessible how do i know what are the courses that i should go after and that brings me back to what we just discussed today try something whole heartedly so just do it do it for 10 hours love it do it for 100 hours you will more or less be certain about this being an exciting thing for you if you don't like it after 10 hours back off try something else there's lots of buckets of 10 10 hours that are available if we just free up some time from instagram and pinterest and facebook absolutely uh so yes very true about relating with the online teaching and also the on site teaching there is a vast difference there uh what about professional development tips for students would you like to give some to the students who really have to get into college uh, choose and opt for the right career choice and then 
obviously they come into the professional world. So what tips very quickly can you give to the students? Sure, two, three things. So one is, uh, and I touched upon this earlier. So make sure that you understand the profession you're aiming for. So the glamour of medicine, for example, it, it's a great service to humanity. And we've seen during COVID, doctors have been on the front line and they have paid a heavy price as well. And they've helped the rest of humanity. But then uh, am I the person who's willing to make that sacrifice? Am I willing to stay awake for 36, 48 hours without having slept? Not everyone enjoys that. So the personal lives of doctors are extremely stressful. So one of the things I repeatedly tell high schoolers is, yeah, you want to be a doctor, you're getting fantastic marks in bio, wonderful, but please go and find a doctor and see 24 hours of their life in reality. See the 2 a.m. phone calls they get from emergencies. See the fact that they barely see their families most of the week and see the fact that they have to study for 15, 20 years. And like other professions by mid twenties, I'm done. Doctors are not done till their early thirties. And then they're still proving themselves in a large hospital and then setting up something. So it, it, it's a tough life. Yes, because there's a long tenure for studies. And then after that, it comes into the real professional world. Yes, absolutely. And, uh, uh, your very topic says something which is very, very important. And how do you compare those degree versus years of experience? That is very important. So you say degree is not as important as experience. So what about the people who are not experienced much and then they don't have apt degrees also? So how do you correlate both the things together? Great question. So uh, historically, universities gave degrees which were a shortcut to signaling that somebody knows something. So, I mean, way back, maybe 50 years ago, there was only one way to learn something. If I wanted to be engineer, I had to go to engineering college. There was no MIT open course where no edX. Uh, now that has changed. So the source of knowledge is now accessible. Earlier that was constrained. Second thing is colleges are also a shortcut for signaling this student is possibly brighter than the average or more hardworking than the average or both. So somebody who gets into MIT has already shown that they are in the top 0.001% of the student population for that year. So when it comes to employers, they use these shortcuts. They say, okay, I mean, why should I take the extra effort of figuring out if somebody is bright, somebody has gotten into MIT versus some very third rate engineering college, I will take the MIT person if I can afford him, of course. Uh, but is that the only way to signal my competence? No. If you look at Google, for example, uh, Google has said they are no longer going to make degrees mandatory for applicants. So what I can do, let's say I want to be a writer set up a blog, start blogging, attract an audience. When I go for an interview, just give them the blog link and uh, they know my credentials now. So, so I am showing that I can do it and I have done it. It's not just a piece of paper that says I might be able to do it. So if I get a degree from a top university that says, okay, I have a BA in journalism, that doesn't tell me that I have done good writing and I can do something about it. Fantastic. Now, uh, in your talk, what I noticed was you talked about passion and career. Now, uh, according to me, to put the drive back into your career, you uh, first must get back in touch with what energizes you. I hope you understand yeah. my point. So uh, very few are fortunate enough to have a career as their passion don't you think they are deprived of something, maybe opportunity? So how do they carry on their lives? It's very difficult. So how right. do you relate it to both the things here? Wonderful question. Uh, so I mean, two potential solutions to that. So one is uh, till a generation back, we were tied to our professions extremely strongly. Now there's nothing that prevents me from reskilling myself and 
moving to a new profession we've seen a lot of people doing that over the uh, recent decade or so so if i am really passionate about something and i have tested that by doing it for 10 hours and 100 hours i can absolutely put in that effort now switching as a cost so yes i have spent 20 years as an engineer now i want to be a, an educator they are not going to put me on a pedestal and say okay you be, become the head of department of mathematics if, if i apply to your school they will say okay start by interning as a teacher we don't know if you can teach maybe you know your algebra well but that doesn't mean that students will love you so i have to prove myself but which is fine i mean there's a cost with everything so there's a cost of staying stuck in my engineering career and saying i'm sad and unhappy versus a cost of switching and jeff bezos in a recent interview said 50% of the time in any job in anybody's job or profession including his own is devoted to things that we don't like doing in in other words he says these things suck but you have to accept that and that's reality everything cannot be great so you do the trade offs so the good versus the bad and then decide whether i am willing to pay that price or i want to move to something else absolutely so my last question because i would really uh, like asking questions and you keep answering but sure. then due to paucity of time i'll just give you one question the last one uh, yes, how can one build on his or her strengths and how does he or she get uh, or stay organized throughout so it's a iterative process as i said it's the same 10 100 1000 10000 repetition but endless repetition at a higher skill level so let's say i want to be a writer uh, i start writing for the school magazine i get published now i have written four articles i can le- rest on my laurels and say okay i am a great writer i am going to apply to a ba in journalism at oxford and life is set or i can say well now there are prestigious newspapers in my city can i get articles written and published there so i have set myself a higher challenge level it will create some anxiety can i get there yes let's say i get published there now is there a reputed magazine or journal which is very hard to get published in can i try and get an essay published there so i have to incrementally set my targets higher and higher and go up that skill ladder and stay in the flow if i stay at my competence level so i am skilled but i'm not challenging myself i will get bored i have to push myself into the anxiety zone then improve my skills and get back into flow yeah so what i understand and all must have understood that you have to stay focused staying focused is the right way to achieve something and you need not be diverted and with this i come to the end of the question answer session it's over to the compiers thank you so very much sir thank you ma'am monica and thank you sir for all your support and guidance given to the large audience by attending to their concerns so patiently during the course of this discussion the audience a gentle reminder to kindly fill in your feedback form shared in the chat box to fetch you your certificates thank you thanks saranjot ishan could you please check your mic I deem it my privilege to propose the vote of thanks. Let me first express my profound gratitude to His Majesty Sultan Hetham bin Tariq Al Said for the magnanimous benevolence showered on the Indian diaspora in the Sultanate of Oman. May the Almighty shower abundant blessings on His Majesty and his country. Our deepest sense of appreciation and gratitude 
to Dr. Shivakumar Manikam, Chairman, Board of Directors, Indian Schools in Amman, and other honorary directors on the Board of Directors, Indian Schools in Amman. Thank you for your encouraging presence and guidance at all times. A heartfelt thanks to Mr. Alkesh Joshi, Honorary President, Indian School Management Committee, and other esteemed members of the School Management Committee for their profound encouragement at all times. I also wish to take this opportunity to express a heartfelt thanks to our prudent captain of the ship, Mr. D. N. Rao, Principal ISWK. Furthermore, I thank honorable principals of the schools of Mena region, Indian schools in Amman, vice principals, assistant vice principals, coordinators, supervisors, and the entire teaching fraternity for their support and guidance. Heartfelt thanks to our chief platinum sponsor, StudyCo, gold sponsors, Gen University, Vellore Institute of Technology, Sri Ramchandra Institute of Higher Education and Gray Matters, and bronze sponsors, Middle East College, Thapar University, MIT World Peace University, Pune, and Dallas Baptist University. Digital partner, Spectrum, media partner, The Arabian Stories, and our valued donors. I wish to thank each and every student and parent for their valuable presence in making this session a grand success. And even if this kind requires the coordination of a committed team, thank you to the ISWK team for making this session of Avenir 2021 possible. You are requested to fill up the feedback form to fetch your certificates. Great things are done by a series of small things brought together. With these positive words, I, Taranjot, and I, Ishan, bid you all a sweet good night. See you in the next session. The upcoming session starts at 7 p.m. on the topic, Study Course Complete Guide to Study Abroad by Mumbakara the Boy. See you there. Stay tuned and stay safe. Thank you.